My name is William Alberk. I'm the Director of Arms Control, Disarmament, and WMD Nonproliferation for NATO at the headquarters in Brussels. So arms control played a very important part in NATO security during the Cold War. It starts with the United States and the hold that Tom Shelley and Morton Halpern's book, Strategy and Arms Control, first in the Kennedy administration, as a concept for how to survive a Cold War, how to manage conflict. This became part of NATO's DNA in 1967 with the Harmel Report, the idea that NATO had two core tasks. First, to deter enemies and to defend itself. And on that basis, on the basis of a solid deterrence and defense, to have dialogue to try to seek to resolve the underlying conflicts of the day, essentially to use arms control to manage the Cold War, to prevent and limit uh, arms races that were ruinous, to prevent unintentional conflict, and to survive the Cold War. This became even more critical in 1979. We saw the SS-20 deployment. In 1976, 1977, the Soviets deploy a new weapon that we think completely undermined deterrence, gave the Soviet Union a first strike capability. So going back to the Hormel report, going back to the idea of deterrence and defense and dialogue, we first decided we had to defend ourselves, to make sure that deterrence continued to work. And this was the decision to base missiles in Europe, the Pershing II and the Griffin uh, cruise missiles. And on that basis of the deterrence being reestablished, then to seek dialogue to eliminate the weapons altogether. This was the dual track decision, December 12, 1979, 40 years ago, next month. Right in NATO's DNA from the start, arms control as part of our strategy to survive the Cold War, to maintain deterrence, and to have security. Right, the SS-20 was a perfect weapon for a first strike. So we thought that this meant deterrence no longer worked, that the Soviets would believe that we couldn't defend ourselves, that this weapon would be able to sever the ability of North America to reinforce Europe. Essentially, it would decouple North America from Europe. The Soviets would be able to strike the airports and seaports that we relied upon for reinforcement and say, okay, now we're just gonna have the conflict in Europe. We won't strike the continental United States. You don't strike the Soviet Union and then the Soviets would win, essentially knocking the United States and Canada out of any potential war. So we had to reestablish deterrence, and the best way we thought that we could do that would be to put weapons in Europe that could strike Moscow. You have to remember at the time, the US had already eliminated all of its intermediate range missiles in the 60s, because basically they were liquid fuel, they were inaccurate, they were not very good for crisis stability. The Soviets, instead of eliminating them, developed the SS-20 to actually threatened to create this capability. So for us, the dual track was, first we had to put something in there that we thought would make the Soviets think twice about launching a first strike. If we had the capability to strike Moscow, their capability to hit our ports might be less attractive. And then again, on that basis, we created at NATO the special consultative group to discuss what would be arms control in this case. Uh, and the idea was we would limit and then eliminate intermediate range missiles. So that was the logic of the dual track decision. First, we would put something on the table that would reassure that we have deterrence. And second of all, we try to eliminate the entire category of weapons. Right, so the INF Treaty was a wonderful thing. It eliminated an entire category of weapons that, as I mentioned before, threatened to decouple North America from European security. That indivisibility of security goes to the core of the NATO mission and the security of the European continent. So violating that treaty was a decision that we think Russia made in the mid to late 2000s, and it fundamentally undermines European security. At the same time, the treaty itself was a good step in eliminating the entire category of weapons, but even at the time, the thought was we would go further. In 1987, at the end of the INF Treaty negotiations, uh, NATO announced that we were getting ready to negotiate the CFE Treaty, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, and to eliminate short-range nuclear forces. It's ironic, if the Soviet Union had survived, we would have continued negotiating to eliminate all nuclear weapons. We didn't. So now we have a situation where the INF Treaty, as it existed up until uh, earlier in the year, 
limited the US and Russia. But what was limiting China, or India, or Pakistan, or North Korea, or Iran? In a way, the treaty limited people's imagination in terms of further elimination of uh, missiles. Now, you remember in 2007, 2008, the US and Russia, um, in the United Nations General Assembly, tried to universalize the INF Treaty. There was no interest. We now are faced with a situation without the INF Treaty where we once again have to really talk about missile threats, and not just to Europe, to the world. As we learned in the INF crisis, only solving the problem for Europe would never work. These missiles are mobile. You can base them anywhere. You can move them very easily. You can put them on planes. You can move them within hours. Ultimately, it's going to be about global uh, solutions. And I think that's what's important now, that we don't think just about European security. We think about global security and how to eliminate those missiles that create situations all around the world where deterrence may not exist, where first-rate capabilities occur, where instability exists, and where the risk of war is real. I think the cause of the current crisis that we have in arms control, not just in Europe, but in the world, is that certainly in the West, we stopped really thinking about great power competition throughout the 90s and 2000s. Uh, the war on terror was an important thing, and we had to think about terrorism in all kinds of new ways. But ultimately, in the West, we lost our eye on great power competition, on the importance of deterrence and making peace with non-cooperative partners. So uh, arms control is great when both sides want to avoid war. But when you have another side that is actually interested in conflict or interested in intimidation, interested in changing the rule-based order, and this is what I think Russia and China are looking for right now. So the crisis in arms control comes because we stopped thinking about great power competition. Russia and China not fully invested in the future of arms control, but actually seeking actively to rewrite the global rule-based order, and therefore using our desire for arms control against us using the rules to violate the rules, using the rules to force us to bend and to change and to undermine our own principles. And we see the expression of that in the invasion of Georgia. We see the expression of that in the invasion of Ukraine. We see the expression of that in the creation of islands in the South China Sea. We see the, the expression of that in Iran sponsoring terrorist groups, in North Korea building missiles. So we need a recapitalization of arms control, but it has to be based on shared interest. And right now, I don't think Russia and China or Iran or North Korea really share our interest in building up a rule-based order because they seek to rewrite the rules, either regionally or globally. That's the crisis that we face today. Why should NATO care about arms control? Arms control is still critical to NATO security. The Secretary General of NATO on the 23rd of October gave the first dedicated speech by a SecGen on arms control since Manfred Warner in 1990, once again putting forward why arms control matters to us. We think it's a tool of security policy. We think arms control, when it's effective, when it's verifiable, when it, it includes reciprocal uh, obligations on all parties, when it's, it adds to transparency and stability, can increase our security. And on that basis, NATO will continue to seek arms control as a tool. We will continue to reach out our hand to Russia and offer them verifiable, restrictive arms control that limits the potential for conflict. But ultimately, right now, I don't think Russia is very interested. I think ultimately, they're trying to rewrite the rules. They're trying to weaponize risk. In fact, the more we ask for transparency, I think the more they think that their risky behavior is working and forcing us into self-restraint, into limiting ourselves, into backing up so that they can expand into that space. So we need to be steadfast on deterrence, we need to be steadfast on our defense, and we need to think about what the rule-based order should be. Just because Russia is not interested now doesn't mean they're not going to be interested in the future. So we need to think for ourselves what we think the rule-based order should look like. And we should advocate for those policies in the Euro-Atlantic area, we should support US-Russian talks, we should support talks with the P3, with the P5, and talks globally to use arms control in an intelligent way to increase global security.